One, two. Good morning. Are you good this morning? It's, uh, it's great to see you. Um, just for any guest, guests or visitors or uh, family who are wondering where other people are, um, that we had um, almost as many of you here this morning at our 8.30 service. Um, I've said to our team many times I want to pull the family back together so this place can be full and we bring out more chairs um, but then we know we're going to have car park issues and uh, and we know when there are car park issues then uh, people start to think of different options and we just um, we love the fact that there's variety tonight at 5 p.m. we have a baptism service um, so we're going to be baptizing a whole bunch of people so I want to encourage you uh, uh, if you'd like to come out would you come out uh, to that service um, thanks Bell uh, for bringing a word. I'm, I'm pretty sure Bell wasn't here this morning. Um, but I want to begin uh, in in the beginning. So I want to begin a, uh, a series this morning, in fact, she didn't know, but called The Pace of Joshua. Uh, the Pace of Joshua. And the direction that I felt to go, uh, I felt like the Lord put the brakes on just to deal with one issue before we get into the logistics of Joshua. Thank you so much, worship team. You guys, did, can we put our hands together for these guys? Thank you, Dina. Nathan, Georgia back. Great to see Sadie. Um, you know you've got an amazing worship pastor when she puts herself on the bass when we don't have a bassist. Amen. Uh, she, she, she doesn't need the spotlight. Um, Lee's got such a great heart and doing a great job, Red and Dina and all of you guys. Um, let, let me pray as we begin. Father, uh, I'm all out of sorts because of your presence, but I thank you for balance, wisdom, direction. Um, I thank you, Lord, that your ways are the best ways and the highways. And Father, I just pray right now for every person in this room, Lord, including those um, who you know that need ministering to the most in this season. Lord, we pray and as we've prayed for Jim and Carly and Lily, Lord Jesus, and a continuation of healing for those who need healing. Father, I thank you for the testimony that we heard of the restored shoulder over the last couple of weeks. And God, I just pray that you would continue to do, do it again. Lord, we know where you've done something. Lord Jesus, there is the, the power and the testimony to do it again. Father, I just give you glory this morning. Lord, let every word of mine fall to the ground, but I pray that as we go out of here, that your word would cut through, Lord Jesus, sharper than a two-edged sword, Lord Jesus, that it would uh, arrive at the place that you've intended it to. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray, amen, amen, amen. Um, to be very truthful without talking about my sermon, if I had it my way, we just would have worshipped all morning. Um, and you all know me, um, but I had a chat with my, my team this week, and you know, even like what Bell said, like one of our mandates here at Presence is to reach our city, and if we're going to do that as pace setters moving forward into 2021, we want to be a, a, a community that can accommodate for someone who walks in and wonders what the heck is going on. We know that God can translate a move, um, but we also want to be a place where you can invite your friends and they don't think they're coming to Wackyville, if you will. Um, I'm just speaking transparently. Um, and, and so we're going to create, as we move forward, our Sunday nights, more of a real worship, real Holy Ghost encounter. Obviously, if God shows up, I'm going to lie on the floor and let Him do whatever He wants in any meeting. Um, and Pastor Kent can deal with the overflow of that. And, uh, and, and, but I'm just saying, uh, I, I just love it. I'm, I'm so grateful. These guys were here from since 7 a.m., maybe 6.30 a.m. this morning, our worship team. Uh, some of them are going to be coming back at 3 o'clock this afternoon to get ready. Kent is at home sick, but he assured me he'd be here filling up a tank at 3 o'clock. Um, so we just have an amazing team um, for all of our AV, for everyone who's serving. Thank you so much. Yeah, come on, let's give these guys a round of applause. You know, I have a question for you. Growing up, um, and I know some of you are like me, we're still trying to grow up. Um, did you have a superpower? Like, like, or did you think you had a superpower? If I, if I, if I could have had a superpower right now, or maybe before I became a Christian, it would be x-ray vision. Uh, the other one I would really, really, really want to have would be to be invisible, um, because I used to be naughty before I was a Christian, and, and God got a hold of my life. Um, and, and I know, I, I know some of you in here are thinking like even worse things than what I just said. Uh, but some of the things that I had as I grew up as superpowers, I, I literally thought I was like strong. 
I thought that there was nothing in the world that could, could defeat my strength as a four-year-old, five-year-old, six-year-old, seven-year-old. I remember even on Sunday mornings, maybe even Saturday mornings, as my parents planted a church, we moved back from the States in Texas to Wollongong, and we were on the pastor's budget, which was pretty much uh, the loaves and the fishes stolen off the little boy. And we got given these couches, and they were in our lounge, and we thought they were couches, but uh, essentially they were foam squabs cut into the shape of couches with that were covered, and we used to be able to pick them up and throw them around the room and build castles. See, we thought we were strong. Uh, I had this inundate ability, or at least I thought I did, to be able to pick locks. Like, like I know you might not think that's a superpower, but for me, I thought I was pretty special. I thought I could open any lock. I think they just opened. Later on, it became not something that I would call a superpower. It was actually detrimental to my upbringing. Uh, moving on, I thought I could drive anything. Uh, like I literally thought I was like, like I could drive anything. I, I would sit and probably be the backseat driver like all three and a quarter of my kids are right now. One just screams, the other three tell me to put my seatbelt on. Dad, stop, it's an orange light. Dad, you haven't buckled Macy's seatbelt. Like, like I thought I could drive everything and the last superpower I thought I had was I could like ride anything. I could ride horses, ride bikes, ride BMXs. In fact, I still think I have that. At Christmas, I sold my road bike so that me and Hunter could both buy BMX bikes because uh, the 40-year-old in me said, hey, let's go and start BMXing again. I, I went around the track about four times and realized it was probably not the best idea to get rid of our road bike, but we're still going to do it. And I had a video I was going to show you, but it's funny, all of my superpowers that I thought were superpowers um, eventually turned out to be not really superpowers. Like there was a time we were living in Wollongong, and, and I think I've told some of you, I went down to get a tennis ball that was down the drain. All of the neighborhood kids were there. And my superpower came out, little Juzzo, and, and, and those grates that are like, like that thick on the side of the road. I managed to prop it up, um, but that's all I remember. The next thing I remember uh, was my neighbor's dad reaching down into the drain as I like woke up from being in an unconscious state and he was like pulling me out of the drain and that moment I realized I wasn't as strong as I thought. We won't go into the ability to unpick locks, superpower, that ended pretty quickly. Um, drive. Uh, when I was about four and a half years old, a lot of things happened in Wollongong for us. Thank the Lord we moved to New Zealand and then back to here again. But, but about maybe four or five years old, I jumped into my mum's car, great supervision by the pastors, just saying, uh, and I was sitting in the, um, that was a joke by the way, I was sitting in the car, we don't do it these days, we have GPS trackers, sitting in the car and I'm playing like spaces, I'm driving the car and as all good kids do, I was shooting the baddies, which meant I had to pull the handbrake and let it off. Uh, I rolled over the late, down the driveway over the neighbor's letterbox and stopped inches uh, from the neighbor's house, actually going through their house. Uh, you could already see my parents had problems with me at like four or five years old. And, uh, and there was this time in Minnesota where I was riding my bike and I honestly thought I could jump anything. I thought I was like the, uh, the Estrada. I was going to draw on the Nitro Circus. I could do anything, no fear. And, and one day I was riding my bike, did a bunny hop. A and I actually, as I came down, I landed on a rake that was sitting at, sticking out the side of a tradie, uh, a lawnmower, a garden maintenance man's uh, a, a, a rake. And got a bruise about that big on my thigh. Please do not play that video. We are streaming. We saw it in the first service. That was enough. And, and, and so I realized that these superpowers, and as we all grow up, we start to realize that superpowers aren't as good as they seem to be when we're young, right? Are you with me or is it just me in this room? <laughs> so I want to talk to you guys about superpowers today. I want to talk to you about one particular superpower. See, as I said at the beginning, we're going to begin this series called The Pace of Joshua. Why are we going to talk about The Pace of Joshua and go through? Because we are in a season where we are pace setters or setting the pace for 2021. Uh, Joshua is an example of what it is to move forward. Joshua is a great example of what it is to plant seed. Joshua is a great example of what it is to take ground that it seemed untakeable. Joshua is a great person who to look at and what it is to fight battles. And Joshua led very well. To be honest, this morning's message was about to be entitled The ABCs. 
to being a leader, to being a pace setter. And I was going to bring you some simplicity, uh, simple points of what it is that Joshua did that led him to this journey. But I felt the Lord give me like a bit of a back slap, a backhand, just, just, just to go this way. And this is just the way I talk to God. I'm sitting there. It was Wednesday morning. I'm just laying out all my ideas. And I felt like the Lord start to talk to me about this, this idea. And uh, and in my language with God, he essentially said, Justin, it wasn't because Joshua did this, did this, did this, did this. It was Joshua's heart that I saw that led him to lead a nation. And in that moment, I felt like the Lord say to me, and I wrote these words down, the truth is the best superpower that we can have is a beautiful heart. So I want to tell you right now, the world will tell you the opposite. The world will tell you you've got to harden up, I understand uh, we missed some dedications. We'll come back to those um, shortly. Um, before we get to the end, thanks, guys. Um, we're really missing Pastor Kent today, aren't we? Uh, he has, he, Pastor Kent is like our superpower in this building. But see, when it comes to Joshua, Joshua's heart is what enabled him to lead a nation where Moses couldn't. I want to show you something. I'm not belittling Moses because at the end of Deuteronomy, it says that no one performed the prophetic signs uh, like Moses did until this day. But there is a point here that John Maxwell highlights a few differences between Joshua and, and Moses. And in no way am I comparing us as Presence Church to Surf City or Surf as Paradise Assembly of God. I'm just merely looking at and probably confirming the prophetic word that came from Bell just before. Some of the things that they say, the difference is Moses, he led through 40 years of desert travel, but Joshua led through 30 years of conquering Canaan. Moses was a political diplomatic leader, where Joshua was a military leader and he was an in-your-face style leader. Moses was patiently listening to all the complaints of all the people. Joshua confronted laziness and fear of the enemy. Moses led people as, pe as a peacemaking shepherd. We know that's what our call is, is, with the right heart. Joshua led people as a tough commander in the context of what he needed to do, obeying God. Moses provided water from a rock when the people were thirsty. Joshua told people to get it themselves. No, this is what he said. He said, Joshua told people to dig their own wells when they got thirsty. And, and see, to confirm, and my confirmation from what Bell just said, we're in a season and a time we're about to start to expand. We're about to start move to, to move forward. I, I'm not just talking about your family. I'm not just talking about your business. I'm not just talking about your workplace. I'm talking about the kingdom of God. Right now, the world is saying, hey, be quiet, shut up, don't do this, don't do that. Excuse my pun. Last night at about six o'clock, I was sitting on the couch, kind of mud murmuring over this. I had tennis on silent because it's boring, but it was the only sport that was on. A and I'm, I'm looking at this sermon. I get a text message from my brother-in-law, and apparently they've already started putting out new threads like uh, or, or websites there's this I don't even know what this one was called it's like a replacement for Facebook and someone had commented that their friend has been mind washed and they now go to Hillsong and they're committed to Hillsong and then all these people started commenting I've never heard of it don't really look at social media to be honest may you put up a few photos and then I saw in this thread that was screenshotted to us oh yeah there's that church in surface paradise where pancakes in paradise is where someone got healed there and they manufactured a miracle uh, and I thought to myself, if ever the world and the devil was trying to silence the church, now is the time. And I thought, now is the time where God is going to reveal, he is going to prove where a Joshua generation needs to rise up and expose a heart. See, my, my, my response and my thought wasn't, actually my response and my thought was, this is my office, this is my phone number, I'm happy to meet with you, come and talk to me. My wife said, don't say anything, Justin, just be quiet. But there is a time where the church needs to stand up. We are a Joshua generation. This is a time where the church needs to know about the tangible miracles that are taking place. They need to feel the essence of the power and the fire of God, not to contradict what I said at the very beginning of this. See, Joshua gives us an example of what it is to lead, but not just to lead, but to lead with heart. See, we can be outside of these four walls and we can say, hey, I went to Presence Church, Hillsong Church, Glow Church, Chapel Church, Forward Church, Highway Church, Elevation Church. We're all good friends. We don't know them all. You can say you went everywhere, but unless your heart is evident to the people around you, they don't care. It's just a name on a building. But if your heart is saying something different in your action and your language, 
then they're going to lean in and they're going to wonder, wow, what is it about this? So let's keep talking. The scripture that I have for you this morning in Luke chapter 43, around the tension of this, Jesus is talking to his disciples in the community that is formed. And he says, no good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick thorns, excuse me, figs from thorns or grapes from bricks. A, a good man brings good things out of the good that is stored in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil that is stored in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. My question for you and the same question I felt the Lord asking me on that Wednesday, Thursday morning this week was, what's coming out of your mouth? And not just what's coming out of your mouth, what is your lifestyle saying to the community around you? See, if it's coming out of us, we might as well take charge of what's going in. Chris Estrada said this, God's not looking at your resume, he's looking for your availability. Joshua's heart positioned him to lead God's chosen people into the promised land. What could our hearts do for us? And when I say do for us, it might sound selfish. I'm talking about do for us on behalf of God as pace setters. There is good news for people in this room. And I think in the context of looking at the Old Testament, there were few that the presence of God was privy to rest on. There were few that were actually chosen, handpicked by God, that had an encounter with God, that saw God. You know, as we know, Moses was the one that saw God face to face. And, and there were so many different accounts and narratives that took place where people saw open heavens, as we saw from Isaiah chapter 6. But in this day and age that we're in now, every one of us have the ability to have a heart transplant. So every single one of us, well, let me say it like this, no one has an excuse not to represent the kingdom of God well. So I come back to the question, are we? Here's what Ezekiel said in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 24. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and I will bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and I will clean you. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. You know, when I'm reading scripture, just naturally, it's something I was taught in Bible college and my parents taught me. Uh, they always said, look for Jesus. Where do you find Jesus in the Scripture? Because Jesus should be everywhere in Scripture. When I read this and I, I hear this, I will cleanse you from all of your impurities and from all your idols. I think of that is what a relationship with Jesus looks like, a cleansing, a grace, a mercy, the old coming off and the new being put in. He goes on, uh, Ezekiel, to say, I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your old heart of stone, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit in you, and I will move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land that I gave your ancestors, and you will be my people, and I will be your God. I will save you from all your uncleanliness. I will call you from the, excuse me, I will call from the grain and make it plentiful, and, and will bring not bring famine upon you. I will increase the fruit of the trees and the crops of the field so that you will no longer suffer disgrace among the nations because of famine. Now we understand, and there is a link to Jeremiah, the context of who Ezekiel is speaking to, but the principle is still the same. When you invite Jesus into your heart, there is a cleansing that takes place. And when the baptism, when the impartation of the Holy Spirit comes, there is a transference of the old nature for the new nature. And in that moment, immediately, before we even learn any theology, before we've sung a worship song, we have the ability to walk out and something changes within us. See, we're all called to be leaders, we're all called to be pace setters. But I think it's so important that we do heart checks every now and again to work out, hey, how am I going? How am I going? Like, where am I at? Like, I know I had to do this a number of times last year. I know I've had to do it a number of times this year. In fact, someone said something to me this morning in between services uh, about something else that's going on. I'm like, God, what's going on there? What do I need to check out? And that's not because I'm holy. It's just because this is a relevant topic. And if we're going to make a difference out there and not be reactive out there, we should be all the more sensitive in here. Amen? 
see condemnation, uh, feeling bad and feeling like, whoa, I don't want to deal with that. That's the devil pushing you away from the things of God. But when you feel a conviction, whoa, there's a check in my heart. Why do I say that? Why am I feeling that? You said that. This is what's going on here. God, what's going on? That's called conviction. That's drawing you to God. Even if you're not working out the problem, even if you need to go to counseling, even if you need to get some prayer ministry, you're going in the right direction. It's called heart operation. It's your superpower. In summary, God is saying in the context of Ezekiel that he wants to give every one of us a pure heart. He's only asking that we would choose him. A couple of thoughts that stand out for me about uh, Ezekiel. The first thing is he was faithful to Moses. Uh, excuse me, Ezekiel. The first thing that stands out to me about Joshua, I have two thoughts and then we're going to stop and uh, go the other way that we were going to do if Lee can help me with the dedications. It's, he was faithful to Moses. Your heart should be strengthened by the battles of your leaders. You know, this might seem like a bit of a setup, but I can tell you the ability that Chrissy and I, after we celebrated two weeks ago, leading five years now going into six years, yes, it's strength from our friends and our community and you as a church. Yes, it's staying close to the presence of the Holy Spirit. But can I tell you one of the main game changers that enabled us to sustain going through all the drama that went on over the last five years was staying close to Pastor Richard and watching how he handled all the battles that came his way. Like, like if I were to be honest and I think about this, we went through in the f second year having to refinance a multi-million dollar contract for this building. Like right now, the building's probably worth maybe 12 million upwards if we were to sell it on a retail market. Our mortgage is around $4 million. And when we were trying to acquire this money and it wasn't happening and we were talking about all sorts of things and it drew out six months, one of the points of strength that came to me was the first week that Richard came to Surf City or Surfers Paradise Assemblies of God Church, the Yanu family, or the Campeses are probably the only ones that may have been here. But the first week they came, Richard realized that there was a debt on the Monaco Street building. So he stood up and he preached on the power of finances from this, the way the story was told to me, was that week they took up an offering and it was enough to pay off the entire debt for the building. So I thought if God can do in an offering what he did there, then he can easily do something here. And the very fact that we're sitting and standing in this building today is a testimony. See, that was one of the testimonies. Staying close to him was the, the honoring. This building was, they were told it was going to be a multi-million dollar uh, cost to renovate it. it. It cost millions of hours of transformations, labor. I remember being in this room and, in rehab and, and I'd been naughty, not because of lock picking or my superhero powers, but I remember this wall down here and I was in here with Kent Green at 4 a.m. in the morning because all the neighbors were complaining and we had jackhammers and we were pulling out the walls that were in here and then we built the floor and every single bit of rock that came out of this room had to go down that stairway and down another doorway. A and I think about like when, when, when everyone else said, no, I love that Pastor Richard just, and sometimes it was to his detriment, but he had this ability to go, no, mate, we're going to do it. A and I love there was something about that. See, when you follow a leader and when you honor a leader. The Bible says, honor your leaders. The only time you should dishonor or step out, excuse me, not even dishonor, uh, but not fall in alignment is when they're causing you to sin. Because if God's put you somewhere, he's put you somewhere for a reason. When I think about Moses and Joshua following him, in Exodus chapter 17, verse 9 and 10, it's the first time that you hear of an interaction, in fact, with Joshua in the Bible. Joshua is there as a young man and Moses is there and Moses says to Joshua, I want you to go out and lead the people into battle. Joshua didn't say, hey, I don't know if that's a good idea today. Weather's off, clouds are coming in, giants are on the horizon. He said, I'll go and do that. So later, when Joshua is invited in 
to the privy place of going into the tent of meeting, as the scripture says, and uh, as Moses would go out of the camp, he would leave his personal tent, all of the people would rise, Joshua the son of Nun was with him, and he would come in, and the, the, the glory cloud would form around the tent, they would come into the tent, and the Bible says that everyone would stand until they were in that place, where the meeting place of the holy holies, the, uh, the, the, the presence of God was. And here's what I love. When Moses went out of the tent, we all know this, we talk about it regularly. When Moses went out of the tent, the scripture says that Joshua refused to leave. Like I think sometimes even I've read it like, no, Joshua just hung out there. Joshua thought, cool, I'm just going to keep soaking. No, the scripture says Joshua refused to leave. See, I believe that Joshua saw the leadership capability and whatever God had done through Moses' life and realized that if he was just stubborn enough to stay in a place where his leader was, that something of the residue of whatever was going on for Moses would fall on him. My point is, if we want to have a good heart, I'm not telling you to follow Pastor Justin, I'm telling you to follow Jesus. I'm telling you to stay close. I'm telling you to lean in. No man will be able to stand before you are the words that came from God after he said to Joshua, just be strong, just be courageous and stay close to my word. He said, no man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Why do you think Joshua had the ability to believe the promise that came from God? Because he saw the promise come through and true when it came to Moses. When he stayed close to his leader and he saw the promises fulfilled. When Joshua came to the Jordan and God gave him the ordinances for the the ark of the presence, the covenant, uh, the, the, the ark of God to go out, and that the Jordan would stand up whenever it was a flowing river. What gave him the ability to believe that God would come through with his word? It, it was when Joshua was standing at the sea, and, and millions of people were coming, and Pharaoh's army were coming behind them, and Moses just put his staff there, and the whole sea stood up. See, because he stayed close to his leader, it instilled a faith within his heart to see it happen again. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. What does it look like to stay faithful? It's staying in this. You know, I started writing, in fact, I've actually already written next week's sermon, which will probably change. The hardest part about writing, reading, writing, and arithmetic is it's probably the most unpopular thing to talk about. Like like I'm just saying, as a pastor, to stand here and say, guys, we need to pray. I know most of us are probably like, oh man, I haven't prayed for a long time. Like I'm not implying, I'm not discrediting, or, or if I'm saying, hey, we've got to read our Bible, we should be reading our Bibles more than just, just like when we're going to work, it's just we fit it in, no, like it should be, or, or when we come in and we, we raise our hands to worship, or we should be on time, not just to honor the worship team, but, but, but to be here. I understand there are logistics around it, but all those things are what helps give us a clean heart and all of those things and a lifestyle of pursuing Jesus in the context of that way enables us to change environments around us I was talking to Barney and the Meads and we prayed and we interceded for Steve and I was personally just so disappointed that we didn't see more of a breakthrough and I remember talking to Barney recently and the conclusion is always that it's never a problem on God's side it's ours, and that's not to say we're not doing something right, but if there's something more that we could be doing, we need to get back into a place of the secret place and petitioning and pulling on God's heartstrings. God, what is it? Where is it? What's the language? What's the dialogue? And I don't want to go down that road. It was the same with Richard, but then uh, when you step out of discouragement and say, I'm not going to let the devil beat me with that, and then you stand up and you think, man, I've got some weird on my shoulder going on, and you think, wait, this isn't me. Maybe we'll just try it, and then when someone sends you a testimony this week and says, hey, for the first time in a long time, I've been able to raise my hand, and the first time in five years, I've able to been able to swim laps of a pool in Noosa. I wanted to test it out before I declare it. A little bit of hope starts to get back instilled within you. See, the best superpower you can have is a superpower of a heart after God. Proverbs 4, verse 23 says this, and this is where the fight is. Guard your heart with all diligence, for from it flows springs of life.
I was just thinking about, I've forgotten his name. He's the American guy, he lives in Mexico now. Hogan, he's seen like 49 people raised from the dead. Like literally people are brought to him decomposing, like, like not like fully decomposing, that would kind of be weird, but, but people like, like, like have died and been dead for days. And his lifestyle is one of fasting, like, like fasting and he runs a lot now, and, and seeking God, David Hogan. And he lays hands on people and even his people lay hands on people and he sees people recover. He's seen people come to life, and I'm not saying this to say, but I'm saying if it's possible for David Hogan, who was a son of God, who has the Spirit of God in him, who has a heart after God, it should be possible for all of us. But the difference is, I think, is, 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 is just getting closer to God, is just being more sold out. I'm going down a rabbit trail. Ephesians 6, verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers against the rulers of the dark and unseen world, against spiritual wickednesses in high places. Last thought for you, we need to position ourselves. We need to be for him or be with him. It's crucial. Once again, it's not popular. In Exodus 33, verse 11, thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face just as a man speaks to his friend. Like I said before, when Moses returned to the camp, his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not, the scripture says, would not depart from the tent. A couple of thoughts for some people and we're done. Stop looking for resources and go to the source. I'm just going to be very transparent, like I see a lot of good books, a lot of recommendations, I've even bought a lot, and they're all sitting on my shelf, but the people who have written the books have gone to the source, and then written what the source said about that, if we would just go to the source and skip the book, we'd save a lot of money, and we would have our own divine revelation from God, Matthew 6.33 says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything will be added, my life scripture, See, see there's something that I think we need to understand, when we talk about presence and we talk about kingdom, we're not just talking about like a mist or a gold dust or like, like a nice feeling. We're talking about the tangible person of God. So when Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God, kingdom is the king's domain. So the moment that you seek the king, you're in his domain and all of the attributes of the kingdom come to you. Hence the reason uh, everything else will be added unto you because you're in the presence of a king. How do we change? Dr. Phil, first time I've seen him in like 50 years the other day because I mat- was on maternity leave. He said, you can't talk your way out of something you have behaved your way into. You must behave your way out. I, I used to, when I was in my young life, <laughs> whatever, I used to use this word a lot, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna do this, I'm going to start jogging, going to start training, going to do the challenge, going to read a Bible plan. But now I realize you've just got to stop making excuses and you've got to do it. If we want to see more of God and we want to have a transparent heart and we want to have more of God in our world, then it has to be action. There has to be an application to it. I love that uh, as I was watching this episode, just to qualify, he prayed as he closed on national television. I'm like, cool, I can use your quote, you're praying. So how... Can we honestly say that David was a man after God's own heart? Because he was hungry for God. He sought after God. He had a passion for spiritual things and he tried to please God despite his failures. His actions proved he was a God chaser. By doing so, he made his capital God's headquarters here on earth. So how do we do this? As I summarize, uh, being a man or a woman after God's own heart is about obeying God, having the same desires as God's heart and seeking to please God rather than people. A man after God's own heart or a woman after God's own heart also repents deeply when they know they have failed God. A lifestyle of repentance when you know that you have missed the mark. God forgives freely. God knows no man will be perfect. To be a man after God's own heart, we do not need to be perfect. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up and join me. Are you guys okay? We had uh, two people that made a decision that they wanted to invite Jesus into their world for the first time. It was just it was a beautiful privilege. Uh, at the back, we have uh, you can see hanging from. I have decided in a desk there that someone that wants to meet with you. 
if you would like to make that decision, you want to get to know what it is to be a follower of Jesus. But I just want to ask and I want to invite you. You know, the scripture says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. See, up until that point, there was separation. There was distance. There was uh, an inability to get into the presence of a holy, good, loving God. But He says, the scripture says, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, so that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. We believe in that moment by declaring that Jesus is Lord by faith that we will be saved, not just to go to heaven one day, but that heaven will come and rest on us now and this day. So I just ask this morning, if there's someone in this room and you know that you're not saved, you don't have an assurance that if something were to happen tomorrow that you would be in heaven with God, uh, this is your moment where it's time and I want to ask and invite you, would you say yes? Would you give your heart to Jesus all across the room? I'm just looking with every eye closed and every head bowed would you shoot your hand up if you're saying that's me Justin I see your hand down the back someone else uh, would just say yeah today's the day I want to invite God into my heart I want to get to know this Jesus I I want to transform I want to change my life I want the heart transplant anyone else in this room I'm just looking around you just saying yes right why don't we all pray this prayer dear Jesus I thank you that you lay down your life so that I could regain mine. Today, I believe that you are the Son of God, that you died on the cross, but rose again. Jesus, I choose you, and I thank you that you chose me. Can we just give Jesus one round of applause in the end?